hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. Good evening, or good morning, depending on when you're joining us. My name is Kristen Mason. I'm one of the pastors here at OKC First, and I would like to be one of the first to welcome you and say how glad we are that you are here. Whether you're joining us here in the room or online, we are grateful for you and grateful for the way that you have stayed connected and engaged through this time. When we gather together, we sing, and we sing not to change God's mind about us, but so that we can lean into and be shaped by the understanding that God's mind about us is made up and the news is good. So I invite you at this time to lean into that truth and hear this call to worship from Psalms 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his compassion is over all that he has made. Transformed in thine own 
bowing here, I find my rest. Cause without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I Sin runs deep, your grace is more, but grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, so teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my right Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. of power that can never fail let their truth prevail over run today's scripture comes from romans chapter 7 verses 15 through 17 
I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome, everybody. We are in the fourth sermon in this new series called Uncommon Time, and we are letting these words of Karl Barth guide us. Karl Barth admonishes us to take our Bibles and then take our newspapers, but to read both, but always interpret the newspapers by looking first at your Bibles. And so I went looking through the news, through the newspapers, and I actually went this week looking for ridiculous criminals. And I'm happy to report I found three. All of these happened late in 2019. Uh, First of all, there was a woman in Wichita Falls, Texas, who has been banned from Walmart after she allegedly went on a wild ride on one of those electric shopping carts for hours while drinking wine from a Pringles can. So she's been banned from that Walmart. In Oskaloosa County, Florida, A 13-year-old boy on vacation with his family in Tennessee stabbed his 15-year-old brother with a multi-tool just in the arm, telling deputies that he would rather go to jail than spend another eight hours in the car with his brother. So that was late in 2019. And then this one, a man stole a credit card and went on a shopping spree in Butler, Pennsylvania, and he was only caught because he kept signing the name thief on all of his purchases, kept signing the name thief. What is wrong with people? There are other things going on too, and in a more serious uh, note, in Canada I noticed that, you know, the land of the maple leaf, I I noticed that they had lost $767,000 worth of PPE, personal protection equipment, protective equipment, come to find out it had been stolen in the hopes of kind of jacking up the market. But why would you steal those kinds of things? What's wrong with people? The stories that get me now have to do with, uh, well, lots of things, but I, I, I especially hate when prescription drugs that are, that are uh, life-saving drugs are priced out of the reach of the people who need them the most. What's wrong with people? There's human trafficking. What is wrong with people. I mean, just look around, look around. You can read your newspapers, you can read your screens, just just look around. We have problems. What's wrong with people? Is it possible that we have underestimated this concept of sin? Now, I, I don't seem to have any problem underestimating your sin if you were on the other side of a particular line from me. If I disagree with you somehow, I somehow can track the severity of your sin. But perhaps I underestimate the grip that sin has on me and maybe the the grip that sin has on everyone. If you take your Bible in one hand and you take your newspaper in the other, you reach an inescapable conclusion that goes something like this. We have a problem. I, I would submit that we have a real heart problem. Now, I've heard that before, too, and I see this on on Facebook at times, and I'm not going to go off on Facebook like I did last week, but I do see every once in a while someone saying, we don't have a racism problem, we have a heart problem. We don't have a poverty problem, we have a heart problem. Well, I I don't deny that we have a heart problem. More specifically, I want to say we have a sin in the heart problem, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have better policy, better thinking, better decisions, a better climate, it doesn't have to be one or the other. In fact, I would say we have both. And if we, really, if we really want to try to untangle from the sin problem, it will take more than just somehow a spiritual exercise, as important as that is. We have to do the other things that put skin and flesh on the good, the right kind of spirit. That said, we have a heart problem. More importantly, we have a sin problem. And even more importantly, we are in desperate need of a rescuer, someone to intervene, a savior. Which brings us back to the Apostle Paul and this book of Romans. I'm not going to go through all the other things that I've gone through the last couple of weeks. Just want to remind us that this is a letter written to the church in Rome that's experiencing some ethnic tension. Paul's trying to write to this bunch of people, trying to salve and and try to hopefully heal over some of these tensions and some of this conflict. 
I want to say to us also that we are still, with the Apostle Paul, we're still dealing with his uh, theological backdrop, which always has to do with the Exodus, but tonight we're going to think specifically about the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. As as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to sit here for a while and think through the implications of the giving of the law, what it meant to the people of God then, what it means to the people of God now. But we're also going to tell another story today that should be close to Paul's mind and close to to our minds too as we read Paul, and that is the story of creation. Paul takes very seriously what happened, the failure that took place in the garden, and we along with Paul will take very seriously the failure that happened where Adam and Eve are concerned there in the garden. A couple other notes before we start reading these very important verses and very confusing verses. Chapter 7 is the most intimidating chapter in the entire book. So here are a couple of things. When you read this terminology of the law, Paul is talking about the law, as in the Torah, that gift from God sent to help the people of Israel to know how to hold up their end of the covenant, how they would then embody the mission to which they've been called. Remember Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, I want to call a people who will then be a blessing to all of the peoples on all of the earth. Through this law, they would know how to make the heart of God and the character of God findable and tangible and touchable. So remember that when you hear this language of the law. He really is here talking about the Torah. Also, Paul will use this pronoun I quite a bit. But he's trying to make more than a point about himself. He's trying to make a point about the people of Israel, the people of the law, the people of the book, the chosen and commissioned people of God, the people who are at times faithful and other times unfaithful, the people who had not yet been able to accomplish the calling for which they had been set aside. So keep those two terms in mind and their meaning in mind as we work through this very difficult book. And we're actually going to start at the beginning of the chapter. And forgive me, I'm going to read to you a little bit before we get to our verses, starting with verse 1. Continuing his theme of trying to help explain the implications of baptism. And by the way, thank you for your, your feedback in last week's sermon. I would say this again. If you haven't been baptized, you need to. You need to be baptized. It's not that God will love you any more, it's that you will understand God more and understand the implications of your faith more. So still talking about baptism, still trying to give us another metaphor by which we can understand the implications of baptism. Verse 1, do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know Torah or know the law, that the law is binding on a person only while that person is alive, only during a person's lifetime. For example, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as the husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Now watch this. In the same way, my friends, you baptize folks have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you can belong to another, to the one who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Skipping down to verse six. We are now discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive so that we are slaves, not under the old written code, but in the new life of the spirit. Now, Paul is again speaking to the ethnic and religious tension between Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles. Now, as you can see in Paul's letters and also in the book of Acts, these Christian Jews had drawn a line in the sand and they said to their Gentile brothers and sisters, you must obey every little bit of this law or else you don't belong and you won't belong with us or with God. And by the way, they were wrong about that. The Gentile Christians, and and all Christians, by the way, and that's inclusive of us, don't belong because of the power of the Old Testament law, the Torah. It has no power in and of itself since it is merely a measuring stick that seems to constantly measure failure. Christians belong to God because of the grace of God, because of the heart of God, because of the intention of God, because of the extension of God in Christ. The law on its own is an instrument of death in that It measures deathliness, our helplessness, our hopelessness while in the grip of sin. 
I'll say this a couple times today. The law, as we understand it, sure, it might curb your behavior, but it will never capture your heart. Verse 7. So then what should we say? That the law then is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have even known what sin was. I wouldn't have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, by the way, don't covet. But sin, sin, seizing the opportunity and the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Skipping down to verse 12. It's the problem is not the law. Paul says here, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Verse 13. Okay? Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. Again, Paul's going to draw the target around the tar- what is supposed to be targeted here. It's not the law. It's sin. It's sin working death in me through what is good, the law, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. Verse 14. We know that the law, gifted from God, is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, says Paul, and Israel is of the flesh, says Paul, sold into slavery under sin. So, does that mean, then, that people are inherently evil? While there are some traditions who hold to that idea, we Wesleyans do not. And I and we don't think this passage supports the notion that we are inherently bad or evil. We are made in God's image. Look again in the garden. Made in God's image, given the capacity to think and choose of free will, entrusted with the mission of God, given parameters for the work and the strict instructions to avoid the one tree, the knowledge of good and evil, this is where we fail. Genesis 2. The Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Okay, you've been given this entire creation to tend, to serve. You've also been given some parameters, and you've been given some very strict instructions. Please do all of these things, but don't do this one thing. You know how this story goes. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said to the woman, he said you would die, you will not die. Here's the deal. God knows that when you eat of this particular tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. God doesn't want the competition. But doesn't that sound good, Eve? You're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6 in chapter 3 of Genesis. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Made in God's image. Not created inherently evil. Made in God's image, but given the capacity of free will, the capacity to choose to sin, to choose The self and humanity, given that capacity, chooses poorly. Humanity chooses self over God and health and the mission of God. The endless cycle of sin and death has begun, and there seems to be no off-ramp. Death and the fear of death gives rights to sin, which leads to death, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now watch this. In the same way as depicted here in the garden, in the wilderness after Sinai, after God gifted Israel the mission and gave parameters and strict instructions in the Torah, God watches as sin again warps their understanding of all of it. And they choose themselves over God and mission over and over and over again. And that's the sin working in them and in us. We say this a lot around here. Sometimes we have the unhealthy habit of remaking God in our own image rather than always living with open hands and open hearts and allowing God to remake us in God's own image. Christians, even today, have the capacity to make the Bible say what they want the Bible to say to fit their circumstances and political opinions. 
Even today, Christians have shown the capacity, even the willingness to weaponize faith to get their way. What I'm saying is things aren't all that different. Like what happened in the garden, like what happened in the wilderness, we still have this strange way of making faith about us and not about God and the other In the wilderness, like in the garden, they had a calling, they had a mission, they had parameters, they had gifts from God, graces from God, and somehow, as they exercised their freedom to choose and choose poorly, they made it all about themselves. They warped the relationship, they warped the gifts, and at the end of the day, sin had won. Like Israel in the wilderness, We all too often forget the God who calls us to our Genesis 12 mission that we would be the chosen people of God through whom God would bless all the people of the earth. But hear me, it's not that we're born or created evil. Sin is evil. The problem is that we somehow can't seem to choose against it. It's as if I'm at war within myself. And now we're finally to the verses that Mindy read for us today. Paul says, okay, the sin that operates in my members, here's what, here's what the result. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. <laughs> Have you ever marched into a room knowing that there will be a difficult circumstance, have you ever said to yourself, self, I am not going to do this thing. I'm not going to do the bad thing. I am not going to give in. I'm not going to lower myself to this level only to perhaps five, six minutes later, do the thing. You and the Apostle Paul. Verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, then I agree that the law can be helpful and good, shows me how to move around. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, that does it, but it is sin that dwells within me, verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot seem to do it. And if I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do is not what I want to do. If I do not do what I want, it's no longer I who is doing it, but it's the sin that dwells within me. The problem is the sin. My friends, I would submit that we have underestimated the power of sin in our lives. Let me be more personal than that. I think I have underestimated the grip that sin has on me. Let me be even more personal. I don't think I am often enough desperate for rescue from sin. Now let me be super personal but kind of turn this around. I'm not sure you are either. Often enough desperate to cry out, Old Testament term for cry out is sa'ak. How often do you sa'ak, cry out to be rescued from sin and the grip of sin? Verse 21, Paul says, John says, we say, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. Paul says, for I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Man, Paul is very clear. He is a scholar according to the law. No doubt Paul has actually committed to memory some of the Psalms that extol the virtues of the law. Psalm 19, Psalm 119, everything is good as it has to do with the law and I will wrap myself like a cloak, I will wrap myself in the law and I will sleep there and I will meditate on it day and night and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it will shape me for life. The problem is we now know, God knows, there is nothing in the law that intrinsically gives life. It measures failure. Does that mean it's worthless? No, not at all. But it is not a savior. The law should never be mistaken for rescue. It is not rescue. Legalists, the law is not, never was, never will be rescue. Never will be. It was never intended to be the rescue. Measuring stick, 
but never rescue. If you have put your hope and your trust and your faith in the law, it is misplaced hope, faith, and trust. Sounding like the person who has put his hope in the law, Paul says, let's say at the top of his lungs, verse 24, wretched man that I am, so in the grip of sin, who will rescue me from this body of death? Now that's someone who understands his predicament. That seems to be an appropriate level of desperation. That is someone who has a shot against sin, not because somehow he's able to weaponize the law, not because he has become a legalist, even where his own life of faith is concerned, but he has a shot to be rescued from sin because he is reaching out for rescue. He recognizes, he recognizes that in his own baptism, he has been separated from his own connection to Adam and is now free to be connected to the second Adam, as he is described in Romans chapter 5, which is Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Just two days ago, I saw another story flash across my screen. This bride and groom are posing for their wedding photos, and it's a beautiful thing. The bride is wearing a glorious wedding gown. The groom is in a tux. You can see the photographer giving them directions as the happy couple pose on the rocks in Laguna Beach, California. They are oblivious to the danger that's coming their way. Oh my God. Then this happens. The couple is swept into the ocean. The guy recording the video stops and calls for help. Then he rushes back to the beach where the lifeguard has already sprung into action. First, he rescues the groom. The lifeguard leaves the groom with a flotation device, then with everything he's got, swims for the bride. The waves keep pounding them. They struggle to stay afloat and then struggle to get back to shore. From the cliffs above, onlookers watch in horror. Oh my goodness. What they fall in the water. Another lifeguard arrives with a floating tube just in the nick of time. The conditions were dangerous. When they got swept off, our lifeguard was able to respond in a very rapid fashion. And uh, you've seen the video, of course, make contact with both of them and, and rescue them. The bride is so exhausted, she has to be carried out of the ocean to be reunited with her husband. May they have a long and happy life together after a wedding day filled with terror. So you take your Bible, you take the newspaper, and you interpret your newspaper having just read your Bible. Now, this week's passage being what it is, uh, this story, and I'm glad they both lived, because the story comes to me like a gift. I mean, you caught this, right? You and I, we are oftentimes in the New Testament understood as, described as, labeled as the bride of Christ. Much like the bride in the water, we are in a desperate situation. Especially as it has to do with the sin that operates in our lives, we are in a desperate situation. The waves and the current are going to carry us out to sea if not for the intervention of our rescuer. Now, in this case, it was not the groom. It was the lifeguard. In our case, to, to make the metaphor work here, it's the lifeguard that is playing the role both of groom and Jesus. We're in a bad way, in desperate need of rescue if you are trusting the law for that rescue, please keep this in mind. The law can try to offer life by curbing your behavior, but it will never change or capture your heart. When was the last time you cried out to God? I would imagine that this is a difficult question for really good people who, as a matter of habit, are not robbing banks, who as a matter of habit are not doing the terrible thing, who as a matter of habit are not terrible to their neighbors. 
but who, like the Apostle Paul, are hopeless and helpless against the current of sin. How often have good people, the people who I see on a regular basis lining these pews, how often are we desperate enough to sa'ak and cry out? When was the last time you reached out to God? When was the last time you were honest about your situation, that you were and are in a desperate need of rescue, and that God in Christ is your only, your last, your best hope? I have bad news. You cannot overcome humanity's sin problem on your own. You remain in desperate need of rescue, whether you know it or not. But I have good news, sometimes understood as the gospel, for you as well. Your rescuer is here. Hands extended and ready when you are. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I said this to you last week. We need to rehearse the posture that we're supposed to have, supposed to have coming out of the baptistry. And that posture is open hands and an open heart. Open hands can receive the gifts and the graces of God, and open hands are easier to rescue, y'all. Open hands are easier to rescue. And I want to remind us of this phrase. I mentioned it last week. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Your rescuer is here. When's the last time you cried out? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we don't cry out nearly often enough. Perhaps, God, it's because we have worked so hard to remake you in our own image, to remake faith into something that benefits us and our side and our opinions. Perhaps it's because we have trusted the law to rescue us when in, at the end of the day, the law was never even designed or meant to rescue us. It was supposed to help sketch out how desperately we are in need of rescue. God, we confess that we just don't cry out often enough. Perhaps we underappreciate each of us, perhaps all of us. And beyond this church, perhaps all of Christendom underestimates the grip that sin can have on us if we are unwilling to reach out, cry out in desperation, if we are unwilling to be rescued. God, we confess that we find this kind of confession difficult. We find it difficult to admit our desperate situation. Teach us, God, how to confess. Teach us, God, how to be appropriately desperate. Teach us, God, that you are always nearby, our rescuer. And now, church, I want to invite you to pray your own prayer of confession now. Allow me to pray this prayer with and for you. May the Almighty God have mercy on you and forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you, keep you in eternal life.
We want to invite you during these moments of prayers of intercession to keep that same open hands and open hearts as we come to God in these moments. It's been this week that I've been thinking quite a bit about those who have gone before us, those who've experienced loss. And those can be in a few moments, some of the names that we'll remember. But it's also been some of you who've experienced loss of so much during these last few months of being able to be with friends or classmates, of being able to have the normalcy of life. And so whatever transition or loss you've experienced in these moments, we wanna make sure we give the opportunity for you to both remember, to grieve, and to move forward in hope. A few names of folks that I've remembered this week is we want to remember the life of Jim Fain. I've been thinking a lot about Lynn Caprero. Lynn and Trudy would sit right here. And for the last, I don't know, Trudy, 25 years, every time we'd come to this moment of the prayer time of the service, you would hold Lynn's hand, no matter the week that you would have, no matter the hopes, fears, or disappointments, or arguments, you'd interlock hands and hold hands. So we remember Lynn. Faces and names like those who've passed away during this season of COVID, like Walt Crow and Jim Harmon and Betty Rice and Russell Eccles and Danita Murrah and Alex Chappelle. Laura Hardy, if you're watching, I've been thinking about Coach Ken Hardy this week. We remember his life. And as you think about the week you've had, maybe you're gonna call to mind someone who's passed away in the recent months or the recent years and give grace and thanks to God for the gift they've been to you as we continue in prayer. And so God, we ask that you would carry us through loss and transitions and grief and bring us hope for each new day. That God, we would say thank you for the grace that you've been to us, mediated oftentimes through people. And God, you would give us steps towards a bright future. God, in the midst of loss, we also pray that for those who've experienced new life, at least two families in the life of this church this week have brought new life into the world. And so for those who are experiencing joy, we God ask that you'd bring grace. God, we ask for those who are expecting soon that God, you would bring a sense of your closeness and your nearness as they await new life in their life as well. This week, we pray for those who need a specific healing touch from God. And we think about Skylar Yates and Kristen Limke, Doug Lightfoot, all who've had a difficult health week and hopefully moving forward and getting better. God, we ask you to bring a sense of your healing in your presence. We pray for those with cancer and ask that you'd be with a couple who've had a difficult week, like our friends Sally Logan and Steve Weaver. But God, we also ask you to be with those who are coming out of cancer or maybe in remission, but God need your continued healing. Friends like Karen Laughlin, Dewey Underwood, and my good friend Bart Wilson. God, we ask that you'd be close, as we've talked about all those in need of help, to the medical professionals who've been on the front lines helping in their professions and also helping with those who've been sick with COVID. And ask God you'd be with all those who are helping. God, be with the helpers. God, we also ask you to be with those in mission, like our friends in Toronto and Cactus, as our teens miss those trips this summer and also specifically Zambia, as we look forward to some updates later this summer of all God is doing in Zambia, Africa. On this 4th of July weekend, we pray for the United States of America. God, we pray for peace. We pray for your presence. We pray for wisdom. And we pray, God, that you would allow us as the church and individuals in the church to bring a sense of hope, peace, and your love to the world and to our nation. God, we ask that you'd be with us and this church family in this corridor at Northwest Expressway, that God, you would bring a sense through us, through a hope box, God, through one, our neighborhood empowered, and through a feeding ministry, and through a mentoring ministry, and through a reading ministry, that God, your hope and your love would be found in this neighborhood. And God, we pray for those neighborhood of churches that make up OKC First, like our friend DeCarla Steele and Bridge of Faith, like the Gathering Church, like our Word and Table Congregation, United Myanmar Baptist Church and Cornerstone Church. God, we ask you to be with Impact Church and God, you would be with every congregation that makes this place their home, that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven through the people and through the leaders and through the churches that make up OKC First and all of our friends. God, it's in these moments we ask you to continue to transform us by this prayer, the prayer you taught your disciples to pray and you can pray in whichever way is most comfortable for you. Let's pray together. Our Father, who are in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you so much for your presence here tonight. It is a bit easier to pray with some of you being in here and hearing and sensing your spirit among God's spirit. We're so grateful for all of you who are watching at home, online. Thank you for the ways in which you are participating in this discipleship, watching and praying and giving and being part of OKC First Church. So thank you so much for all you're doing. We do want to ask you at this time, if you have a prayer request, if you could send that prayer request in via email to prayer at okcfirst.com. It's always helpful for us as a staff to know how to continue praying for you. We're grateful for all those prayer requests we've been getting. Go ahead and send some of those in even right now from your phone. That would be great. If you are a guest who've been watching online and haven't kind of checked in, but maybe this is your second or third time and you're just kind of incognito watching the OKC First Church services, please let us know by sending an email to info at okcfirst.com. We would love to say thank you for watching and thank you for being a part and maybe find ways to connect you to a Sunday school class or a small group ministry or some of our Wednesday night activities. So thank you for watching, but please let us know if you are at info at okcfirst.com. I want to go ahead and ask if that slide can go up for our giving slide. We're grateful for all the ways in which you are giving, giving sacrificially. Uh, you can see you can mail a check into that address on your screen in front of you. You can also give via text. I mean, if you're giving online at giving.okcfirst.com. And you can see for those of you who are here, we have a giving um, tray for you at each exit on the west exit and the east exit. And so thank you for all the ways in which you are giving. And this is one of those seasons when it gets into the middle of the summer and we're not necessarily all together on behalf of the board, on behalf of the staff. Thank you for the ways in which you are giving but also on behalf to say, we need your continued help financially, and we are grateful. So let's pray towards that end now as we ask God to bless these moments of worship as we give back. And so, Jesus, we come with open hands and open hearts into this moment, asking God that you would bless every gift that is given for the kingdom of God here and around the world. And God, you would bless those who do this is a difficult time, and you would provide your presence, and God, you would provide a way in which a bright hope and bright future can be seen. It's in the name of your son we pray. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us at OKC First. We are a church that is learning to do three things. Friendship with God, friendship with one another, and open friendship for the sake of the world. As we continue these limited in-person worship gatherings on Friday nights at six o'clock, I just want to say a big thank you to Aaron Bullerjack and team of greeters and cleaners and people who are making this experience on Friday nights really safe. In fact, I feel much safer at church than I do if I go to the grocery store in the middle of the night or even during the day. I feel like our church is doing really, really well. And so thank you for those who are watching now for wearing your masks during the service. So many of you are just being so hospitable and kind in the way that you are going to church on Friday nights. And so thank you for all that you're doing. And thank you for so many of you who are watching online on Sunday and throughout the week. We are grateful for the ways in which you are engaging in the life of OKC First. And before we hear from Pastor Lisa about our upcoming VBS, I want to invite you to another service we're going to be having on a Sunday. Next Sunday, July 12th at 3 p.m., we are going to be having the memorial service for Pastor Walt Crow. As most of you know, Pastor Walt recently passed away, and the family from all over the nation and all over the world is gathering together in Oklahoma City on July 12th and in our sanctuary on July 12th at 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon. We're going to be having his memorial service, and we want you as the church to be able to be invited. We would love to have you come, and we're going to be taking the same precautions we take on Friday nights as we will on that Sunday afternoon service. We would love to have you come and celebrate Pastor Walt, surround Linda and the family. One of the favorite things that I love about BB VBS, and I want to share this with you guys, is the atmosphere that is created. We sense the love of Jesus here. And one VBS, several years ago, towards the end of VBS, a kid came up, and it was one of our times when they were gathered up on the stage. And this little boy in our neighborhood looked up at me, and he said, does Jesus only love me in this place? And of course I told him, no, Jesus loves you all the time in every place, wherever you go. But what it um, dawned on me was that that kid felt the love of Jesus here. And he maybe experienced that for the very first time. So guys, BBS is important. It's why we do it. We want our kids to experience that love of Jesus. And so even though we have to be virtual, guys, they will experience the love of Jesus. We'll be doing a VBS called Custom Garage, where they will experience the transforming love of Jesus Christ and how it transforms their heart so that they know how to love God, love others, and serve others. We look forward to this week. And finally, one more need and opportunity for you to help out our church and our surrounding neighborhood. This last Friday, we served 25 families in the life of the church through our Hope Box. And our Hope Box is bare. So thank you for all that you have brought. But we need once again to restock that to be able to help these families who are coming on Friday for the hope of food in their pantry. One more new additional note about our Hope Box ministry. One of our generous members has donated a refrigerator and freezer for that room. And so you've been bringing incredible amounts of non-perishable gifts that we give away to our neighbors on Fridays. But now you can bring some of those perishable items like fruit and, and lunch items and lunch meat that we can be able to also give away on those Fridays. So thank you for all you're doing. We wanna let you know that you can bring different items to the Hope Box that we'll give away each week. For more information about OKC First, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as at okcfirst.com. Thank you for joining us at OKC First. We're so glad you're with us. We sing hallelujah, let thy kingdom come in our hearts and our homes. Let your will be done as we go. We shout and we proclaim, let your will be done in us. We sing hallelujah, let thy kingdom come in our hearts and our homes. Let your will be done as we go in your name. We shout and we proclaim, let your will be done. As we go in your name, we shout and we proclaim.
shout and we proclaim let your will be done in us thank you to everybody who makes this possible for all of the musicians and all the people behind the cameras and the folks who help us with the sound thank you for allowing us to worship in this new sort of way i want to remind us that when you come out of that baptistry the baptized are available for a new covenantal commitment, one that will repair the image of God in which we are created. We call that process sanctification. Please remember, you will need this gift of a benediction. I will too, as we still remain in that process. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls us is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>